We're going to read first verses 9 through 11, and then we'll begin. Uh, for those of you who may be new to this fellowship or are here just for, uh, as a visitor today, let me share with you, we've been going through the book of Revelation. Revelation is a book that can be taught in a variety of ways. One of them is when you look for every single thing that you can find to kind of point out what's going on today around the world. That can be exciting. Sometimes it's, it's incorrect, but it can be ex exciting. What I've chosen to do is to actually teach the book, which means that you're going to receive information that you might not always receive in a study such as this. So there are those who think, man, that's a lot of information. I don't know what to do with it. Um, just, just catalog it because... Uh, that is the kind of thing that helps you to understand the book, and in the future, perhaps, you'll be able to do so with a little more understanding. Now, the second thing is, is my, my spiritual gift is, is teaching ex and exhortation. So those are my gifts that I have as I, as I approach the pulpit. Exhortation is my main gift. Teaching is a gift that the Lord has gifted me with, and, and that's why I like to give details you will see that there are going to be places I stop and just start talking. That is when the exhortive gift comes in. You'll see that. I'm just letting you know in advance because you wonder, what happened to him? Well, the light switch went off and exhortation comes out. You're going to see that. So I like to give information because I think information is very important. But at certain points, you're going to see that I'm going to move into saying things that I think are very practical and applicable, and you'll see that as we go through our study, just letting you know lots of details and some exhortation. So here we are, Revelation 21. We'll begin at verse 9. We'll read to verse 11. We'll get into our study. What we're looking at is heaven's capital, heaven's capital. In verse 9, Revelation 21, reading to verse 11, John writes, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, as we've seen, the holy city called New Jerusalem descends from heaven. The New Jerusalem is the place that Jesus said that he had gone to prepare a place for his followers. I mentioned to you in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, that Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So New Jerusalem is the Father's house that Jesus went to prepare for us. It is a place that God says he will dwell with his children. We saw in Revelation 21, verse 3, how John said, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be there with them and be their God. New Jerusalem is what we call heaven, the place that God dwells with his holy angels. It's the place that believers are going to go when we die. It is this place that will descend after the 1,000-year reign of Christ called the millennium. It will be the capital city of the new heaven and the new earth. Now, with the descent of New Jerusalem, we're given a preview of what is called the eternal state. John had been given a vision of the final end of all who have died in their sins, and he, he told us that, uh, that these who die in their sins will enter into a place of judgment. A place of judgment is called the lake of fire. It's also referred to in verse 8 as the second death. The second death. You see, when the Bible speaks of the first death, it speaks of physical death. The second death speaks of their condition throughout all of eternity. The first death that claims every person is actually temporary because after they die, all people will partake in resurrection, either what is called the first or the second resurrection. In, Revel in Revelation 20, verse 6, we read, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. 
but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Well, the second resurrection is of those who are unsaved. And in the second resurrection, they are judged by God. And the final judgment, we've already seen this, I'm just recapping, the final judgment and punishment is the lake of fire. And that is what is called second death. In Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15, it says, Then death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This, he said, is the second death. Well, God has prepared a city for those who enter eternity as believers. And the city will be the place where believers reside in eternal joy and peace. New Jerusalem is the link between the new heaven and the new earth. It's the city that Abraham looked for when he was called to leave and to follow after God. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 10 says, Abraham waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 24, the writer went on to say, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. You see, what Abraham looked forward to is what is revealed and described by John. So today, we're going to get a better look at heaven's capital, New Jerusalem. Notice in verse 9 how it begins. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. The last time an angel was mentioned was in chapter 20, verse 1, a thousand years earlier. This was the angel that was used to bind Satan in the abyss for a thousand years. Well, this is one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the plagues that we saw in chapter 15. The angel comes as a heavenly tour guide to show John heaven's capital. Now, notice how New Jerusalem's referred to as the bride, the lamb's wife. It is the bride because it's where all believers are forever united to him. It's the lamb's wife because the marriage supper has already taken place. And it says in verse 10, how he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So this angel brings him to a high mountain, shows him what he calls holy Jerusalem. And in verse 11, it says, having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So John sees a beautiful city. It is so amazing and gorgeous, if you will. It looks like he describes her as like a beautiful bride. It's a city that is described as having the glory of God. And radiating from the city will be the full manifestation of God's glory. And his glory will be so brilliant that there is no longer a need for the sun. You'll see that in verse 23 when it says the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And so it's so brilliant, it never will again need sunlight. This is uh, something that was spoken of in an Old Testament book called Isaiah in chapter 60, verse 19, where it reads, No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. And so notice in verse 11 how he says, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. What he's beginning to do here, and we'll look at this briefly, but what he begins to do is give a description of its beauty. The city appears to John like a beautiful and a precious stone. Jasper. Jasper is a word that describes a diamond, one that is crystal clear and flawless. So by this, we see that heaven's capital city is pictured as a, a huge precious stone. 
And as a precious stone, it doesn't produce the light. It only reflects it because as we see in verse 23, again, Jesus is the light. So it reflects the light. Stones don't generate their own light. We know that. Those of you who have, uh, have uh, diamonds in your ring, you know, perhaps some of you ladies have a diamond uh, or two. Um, when you go in to the uh, gym to buy a gym, I just was remembering something. Probably it's not part of this Bible study, but I'll say it anyway. I just remembered. When I bought Marie our, her engagement ring and her diamond, I really thought that I was, I was spending a ton of money. And I went and I got her an engagement ring. And, and the way I, I asked Marie to marry me was at a Bible study, original Bible study that I had. And we invited some of the people uh, to come. Marie had, uh, I, I met Marie at this Bible study. And so I invited some of the people who could show up to come. John and John's mom and dad didn't show up. I still am mad at them, John, by the way. Because I used to teach a Bible study at John's house when he was six or seven years old. And so, um, but I did that. And uh, in my family, my dad has a ring. It's a little ring, cost 57 cents. And um, that's what he had asked my mom to marry him with. He used that ring as the engagement ring. But I had bought Marie uh, a diamond ring. And so I, I remember reading Proverbs 31 and saying to her, will you marry me? I got to stop for a second. Wait a minute. Because she did. My life's been miserable since. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a beautiful memory but I had a ring I thought it was a great ring it was a quarter diamond one quarter carat it cost me two hundred dollars and I, man, I, 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 I that, that was expensive I thought a little bit different now isn't it and so that little teeny thing well the way that they make diamonds look nice is they put them on a, a black kind of backdrop, right? Some you ladies perhaps know this better than men. On velvet, there you go, thank you. Tell me some more. <laughs> Different grays? Okay, let me see your ring. <laughs> I can't see it. At 250, see, you're, you're, a, you're a big spender. So you put it on backdrop and uh, and, you, and that's because it doesn't generate its own light. It reflects. And so when he's speaking concerning this beauty, you need to realize that the, the stones don't generate their own light. They reflect it. And so this place that is described in this way is showing us how amazing and how beautiful it is because it's reflecting the light because the light is Jesus Christ. Like we said, saw a moment ago where it says in verse 23, the lamb is its light. It's only reflecting, and it's a reflecting the glory of the Lord. Now, notice in verse 12, also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates, it says to us. And not only did it have the 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So he begins to give us a description. It's a great high wall. Now, obviously, we'll see again in a moment, this represents exclusion, and I'll share you a little bit about that in a second. But this great high wall had 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. So the high wall, 12 gates, it reveals specific dimensions. The walls indicate that entrance is reserved for certain individuals. At the gates are 12 angels. They would be like, if, if I were to try and liken it to something like God's honor guard, if you will. But they also are representing service, and they are, they are actually ministering spirits, according to Hebrews 1.14, where the writer said, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? Well, the 12 gates have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel written on them. So this celebrates for all eternity God's covenant relationship with the nation. Now, there are those today who do not value the nation of Israel. All you need to do is watch the news, and some of you watch it habitually, others on occasion. Perhaps some never watch at all. But all you have to do is watch the news and look at current events, and you'll see that 
There are those who believe that the destruction of Israel is something that is valuable to them. We've seen that throughout history. I'm not going to go into history lesson about those things, other than you're seeing it even today in current events when you have the rockets that are coming in and falling on various places and, and all of that. Why? Because they believe that, uh, that the nation of Israel has no reason to exist, and they're trying to wipe the nation out. And so they have no love for, they do not care for what Israel or what Israel has given to the world. We can see that. Well, Paul made it very clear in his writings that Israel has given much to the world that we should be thankful for. You see, in Romans 9, verses 4 and 5, he says, The people of Israel, theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. We have much to be grateful to Israel for because so much has been contributed, including our Messiah. Now he speaks in verse 13, and he says, Three gates are on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And so he basically reminds us of these gates. And, and when you see the gates, the way they're situated, that would remind you of how the 12 tribes camped around what is called the tabernacle, which was a portable tent that was used to house the Ark of the Covenant and all of that, that traveled with Israel until they built a temple through Solomon. And so that reminds us of how the 12 tribes camped around the tabernacle in the wilderness. And when you look at the book of Numbers in chapter 2, it gives the same kind of picture of how Israel was to encamp. The stones that we see are spoken of here in verse 14. It says, The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so what we have is we have foundation stones that represent the church. So we have the 12 tribes of Israel that are represented, but we also see the foundation. And you see that in Ephesians 2, verse 20, where Paul said, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So this is a picture of the foundations and, and, and the, how God through Israel and the apostles has created the kingdom. And verses 15 through 17, he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. He measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel." And so what we have here is, well, notice verse in verse 15, he says, he who talked with me. In chapter 11, John was given a read and a command. He had said, measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Here the angel has a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. Now in verse 16, it says, the city is laid out as a square with walls that are um, 1,380 to 1,400 miles in length. I want you to think for just a moment, because when I say that, it doesn't, it doesn't. 1,400 miles is the distance from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. And it would be from Colorado east to the Atlantic Ocean. That's how big that is. That's a good size. It's very large. So notice in verse 16, its length, breadth, and height are equal. And the city is in the shape of a cube. Verse 17 says, He measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. That's interesting. It's more than likely speaking of the thickness of this wall, which that, that would represent about 216 feet. Now, there are no more details, but by saying it's the measure of a man, we can take that as literal measurement. It is the place of all the redeemed throughout the ages, and that's where they will, we will inhabit. Now, in verse 18, the construction of its wall was of jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. 
The foundation of the wall of the city, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. So, heaven, the construction of the wall, he begins to try and describe to us something that's indescribable. Let me speak about this for just a moment. How do you describe something? Well, if I were blind and somebody were to approach me and speak to me and say, it's like the color blue, I would have no frame of reference. I've never seen blue. So how can you describe blue? Can you describe blue to someone who's never seen it? Because we would say when we describe blue, we'd say, well, the shade of blue, it's like the sea or it's like the sky. Well, I've never seen the sea. I've never seen the sky. How do you describe something I've never seen? Or if you approached and said, it's the smell like a rose, but if I have no sense of smell, how would I know what that is? Can you describe that? Because all we can ever do is use something by saying it's like, it's like. It's, so he's trying to give to us something that we have yet to see. And as he's doing this, he's describing something that really is in such a magnificent way. It's really indescribable in many ways. He says that the, the wall, the construction of the wall is jasper. Again, that's a very clear. It's a clear diamond-like stone. He says the city is pure gold, like clear glass, allowing it to radiate the glory of God. Now, when you look at this, by the way, with everything made of clear substance, <laughs> there's no privacy. There's no privacy. But that's not going to be necessary because in heaven there's nothing to hide. So there's no need for it. But as he speaks, he gives to us in verses 19 and 20, and I'll just read uh, Jasper, which is a completely clear diamond. Sapphire, it's like a diamond, yet it's brilliant blue. Chalcedony is an agate. It's sky blue with stripes of other colors. Emerald, we all know that as bright green. Sardonyx is red and white. Sardius is dark orange or even red quartz. Chrysolite is transparent gold or yellow. Beryl is greenish yellow or a blue. Topaz is yellow green or blue. It's transparent. Chrysoprase, chrysoprase is gold tinted. It's green like an apple. Jathens is red. Violet can be reddish brown, even a shining blue. Amethyst is clear quartz. It's, it's crystal from purple to intense purple. So this dazzling intensity of color is spectacular to imagine. But what is also touching, I want to look at this for a minute, and I'm going to develop this. Notice verse 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. The street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Let me share something with you that might blow your mind when you think about it. So, one, this will be the obvious thing. This is where the term the pearly gates comes in. You've heard of the pearly gates. Well, when I get to the pearly gates, well, that's where that phrase came from, the pearl gates. Each wall has pearl gates. And notice again, the streets are pure, transparent gold. Now, I mentioned to you that the city is a cube. That means it will rise 1,400 miles in the air. So think for that. It'll rise 1,400 miles from the base to the top. 1,400 miles, 1,400 miles, 1,400 miles is the shape of a cube. Well, each gate at the base of that cube, this is where it gets mind-boggling. And I hope this makes sense to you when I'm through with this. If it doesn't, I'm sorry. The gate is a cube. There are 12 gates. 
Each gate rises to the height of 1,400 miles. Yeah, thank you. 1,400 miles. But I want you to notice something. This is where I think this is really amazing. I'll read verse 21 again. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. Okay, one pearl, 12 gates, 1,400 miles high. So one of the commentators that, that I want to quote is named John Phillips. And John Phillips pointed out that the other gems that we've seen are either metals or stone. The only thing, the only thing that is mentioned that is formed by a living creature, an oyster, is the pearl. The only thing that is formed by a living creature, an, oy an oyster, is the pearl. So why would the gates be made of pearl is the question. And so Bible commentator John Phillips points out that sand settles in the oyster shell and it irritates and actually wounds the oyster. Around the thing that causes it pain, the oyster produces a pearl. The pearl is the response to that which wounded it. That means that the saints that pass through the gates will be eternally reminded of one thing. Entrance was granted because Jesus was wounded. It gets better. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So the enormity of the gates will eternally serve to remind us of the price that was paid that we might enter in. They will forever remind us of the one who paid the price for us. In Ephesians 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, which means we cannot work our way to heaven the price of entrance is too high. We enter in by faith, believing that the price has already been paid. The only way I can enter in is through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how it works. And that's something that for eternity, the enormity of this will remind us of the enormous cost that God was willing to ransom us by sending his precious son, Jesus, who died on that cross, poured out all of his blood. How could I ever think that I could pay for entrance into heaven? That's what throws under the bus the idea of us working our way to somehow do something, me, a puny slave to sin. What could I ever do to ever get entrance into heaven? I could do nothing. That's why I received the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's how that works. And that's something to think of. And this picture here, when you read this, understand that you're looking at a gate that's, that's huge. It's, it's amazing. And 1,440 miles high, what's that tell us? The enormity of the price of, of our salvation. Never take it for granted. Never take it for granted. Now notice in verse 22, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Uh, if you read through, as we have a Revelation, up until now, we've seen a temple in heaven. We saw it in Revelation chapter 7, chapter 11, chapter 14, chapter 15, as well as chapter 16. A temple was mentioned, but no longer is there a structure. There's no temple necessary. Why? Because the true temple is with the people. Believers now have access to the most sacred fellowship with God. No longer do they need to go somewhere to worship because he's there with them. Believers will always be with them. There's going to be no time that our fellowship with God is broken. There's no need for a temple. There's no need for a church because the uh, building because he is with us. He's there. Now notice in verse 23, the city had no need of the sun 
or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. God himself is the source of light in the city, and his glory dispels any darkness. In 1 John 1, verse 5, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so God illuminates it. The Lamb is the light. And verse 24, the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no light there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. We'll look at that for a moment. When it says in verse 24, and it says in verse, uh, when it says in verse 24, the nations, and in verse 26, the nations, that word nations, for those of you who take notes, you might find this interesting. The word nations in the original language is ethnos. Ethnos. It speaks of the nations. It was used most commonly to speak of those who were not Jewish. It speaks of the nations. It, it speaks of people, but it's not specifically speaking of what we would call national or racial identities. He's saying that people from every nation shall be united in Jesus as the people of God, and no longer will people identify by their national and ethnic origins. People will identify in the way that they should as being God's children. In Revelation 7, 9, and 10, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Let me share with you again for just a moment why this to me is so important for us, especially today. Listen carefully, and hopefully this will be clear and make some sense to us all. We are living in a time, now I get practical, and this is where exhortation starts coming in. We're living in a time, we all know this, let me address it, when this nation that was e pluribus unum, we were all one, united as one, from the many one, it's now being divided into groups and subsets and subgroups to the point that our nation is being divided from the inside because so many are beginning to identify first and foremost by their ethnicity. Now, I could go on for a long time. I won't because you didn't come here to hear me say this particular thing today, but I'll say a few things. And I'm going to try and find the words to say it properly. If there's anything that's going to unite this nation, it's going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it's going to be the gospel. And I'll tell you, and we all know this, but let me say it. Perhaps some are watching right now. We have m many various and various uh, countries outside of the United States watching right now. There's a big, uh, uh, there's a, a large undermining, I think, of the unity of, the, of America right now by breaking us into groups and subgroups. And so I'm concerned because on the one hand, we have made one group within this nation the evil group. And all other groups are able to say, oh, you are this. And you all know what I'm saying. I don't have to go into detail about that. I really believe that when you're in heaven, it doesn't matter what group or subgroup that person next to you belong to. You know why? Because those groups don't matter even now. What matters is unity in Christ. And laws will not make me love somebody from a different group. You can pass as many laws as you want to tell me I have to love this group or that group. 
this group or that group. You can pass those laws, but you cannot tell me who to love and who not to love. That comes from a deeper source. And when I got saved, it was the Holy Spirit who told me, you're one in Jesus Christ. Therefore, it doesn't matter if you're black or brown or white or Asian. It doesn't matter if you're Native American. Now, if you look at me for a minute, people don't know what I am, and that's okay. If you know me as a Christian, that's the key. That's the key. My heritage 42% Native American. You probably wouldn't know that, would you? 33% Spanish. 10% Portuguese. Didn't know that. 9% French. 3% Basque. I am the United Nations. And so I know who I am, and I love my culture. I love everything about being who I am. I have no... Shame, you know, I didn't, but I didn't have to march. I was asked when I was 18 to become part of the Brown Beret. One of my friends, some of you don't even know what that is, but it was like a counterpart to the Black Panthers. And I had a friend of mine whose, uh, whose brother was one of the, he was like a captain in it. He wanted me to be part of that. I wasn't even saved. And I said, listen, marching and being angry isn't going to change this nation. We need something greater than that. I'm not going to march as a Mexican because I'm an American and I'm going to live for the right kinds of things. Now, that's not, that has nothing to do with not loving what I am. Take me out to eat. You'll find out what I am. You know what I'm saying? Take me out to eat. I've been sitting at Mexican restaurants eating menudo, and people will walk up, here. you eat menudo? Who doesn't? <laughs> of course they do. I love it. Why not? But see, but if you don't eat it, say, oh, you can't be my brother. <laughs> you don't eat that, right? So we got, listen, this is something that every time I get here, I say it. We are one in Jesus Christ. He makes us one. And we can, and, and in heaven, it doesn't matter. You're not going to look for some white person. I'll hang with them. You're not going to look for some black person over here. You're not going to be looking for a Mexican mowing the lawn. You're going to be. <laughs> I'm playing. Don't get mad at me. We're one in Christ. And, and please understand that, you know, I don't know how to say this. I, I fear that the church itself has been divided. It, it has. The church itself in, in, in the United States has been divided. You know, listen, I don't care if you're brown. I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're Asian. I don't care what you self-identify with in, in terms of what you are, Swedish, you know, Hungarian. What do I care? If Jesus is your Savior, like it or not, we're brother. We're brothers. We belong together. And we've got, we've got to unite. We've got to unite. I'll say this. I'm going to get in trouble. I'll use the first service for the radio. <laughs> and I say this to my Hispanic brethren because I know it's very deep. I know that. I am not a Mexican pastor of a Mexican church. I'm a pastor of a church. That's what I am. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't, you know, Paul said he loved his brethren according to the flesh. Paul was Jewish, and he loved his Jewish brethren so much, he said, I would give up my own salvation so they could be won to Christ. There's nothing wrong with loving what God made you to be. And I love what God made me to be. I would have nothing else. I love it. Somebody says, you love Mexicans? I married one. I have Mexican <laughs> kids. I love what I am, but not to the exclusion of you in my family. You belong to me, and I belong to you. And this church has got to always understand that. We belong together in Jesus Christ. This isn't a Mexican church. This is a church. We have to understand that because I really believe that in our day, race is being used to divide us in ways that I never saw in the years that I've walked with the Lord. It is dividing even 
people who love Christ. And that should never be. And that to me, remember I told you I'm a, an exhorter? That's, that's what makes my heart move. It really does. And so we need to understand that together we worship the Lord. It says in verse 24, the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Those who were, were, who were once rulers are now placed in an equal plane with others. In verse 25, its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. In ancient cities, gates were closed at night to protect themselves from, from invaders. That is no longer necessary. In verse 25 again, there, there shall be no light there. That's because there's no need to sleep. You don't adjust to seasonal changes. And it says in verse 26, they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Again, there'll be no divisions, no exclusions because of race. These distinctions dissolve in the light of eternity. And then he says, there shall be by no means, verse 27, but there shall by no means enter in, enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let me talk to you about this for just a second. Notice again, verse 27, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. Now, remember we already saw in verse 8 of chapter 21, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let me say this very quickly. I didn't really build on this, but I will share this very quickly in verse 8. Notice the first one, cowardly. Cowardly. Let me see. Okay. When I first got saved, I was taught to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and I did. Not only when I stood up and prayed to receive Christ, but when I left that place. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I also will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Cowardly. There are many today in the United States, if they take a survey and they're asked, what are you? They'll say, my religious faith is Christian. When I went into the army, they asked us, and they even gave us a, a sheet of paper with all these denominations, you know, which one do you associate with? I was Calvary Chapel. They didn't have Calvary Chapel on, the, on this list at that time. So I just chose a Protestant denomination and I put it there because that was in case you die in battle, then you end up um, having this particular funeral service. That's why they did that. So from the very beginning, I was taught, confess the Lord Jesus Christ, not just by standing up and praying, but by living for him. And I also was taught that to deny him was to actually be denied by him. And so very early, I was taught, you need to live courageously for Christ. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Gentile. So I was taught that the power of God is in the gospel of Jesus Christ and that I was called as a believer, not as a pastor, but as a believer, I was taught to confess Christ and share him with people. And so there are people who call themselves Christians who are unwilling to confess Christ. The cowardly are not entering in. Why? Because that confession that they may have made just by saying something was not genuine. They weren't transformed. They are not followers of Christ in reality. That's why the cowardly are not entering in. Why? Because you need to be willing to stand up and say, I belong to him and I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of being uh, called a Christian. As a matter of fact, I wear that as a badge of honor. That's what I am. And you have to identify in that way and live that way. And that's why when I got saved, the first thing I did is I went across the street and I shared with some people. And then I came home and I told my mom and my dad. And then for the next several weeks, I lived for Christ. Then I opened the Bible to my dad. That's what provoked me to share with him and tell him he's going to hell without Christ. Why? Because the Bible tells me that without Jesus Christ, you enter into the lake of fire. And I believed it then. 50 years later, I still believe it. You have to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and not be ashamed of the gospel. And the cowardly don't enter in. So let's man up or woman up and talk for Jesus Christ, especially today when it's so easy to deny him. And so he says, they shall by no means enter in. 
anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie. And now I'm going to close. You're thinking, are you going to finish? I have to. Verses 1 through 5, he showed me in chapter 22, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was a tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. His servant shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no light there, night there. They, they need no, no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. I'll read this quickly. The angel shows John a pure river of water of life. He says it's clear as crystal. Now, we know there are no longer any seas according to chapter 21, verse 1, which means they have no hydrologic cycle. There's no longer any sun. We saw that in verse 23. And no more seas, which means there's no longer any rain. So if there's no longer rain to fill rivers, the river that we're looking at is a symbol. It's a symbol of eternal life. This is a pure river proceeding from the throne. It's a symbol of the flow of eternal life from God's throne to heaven's inhabitants. Like it says in Isaiah 12, verse 3, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So it flows from God's throne, and it's pure. It represents the constant flow of life from God's throne to God's people. And it's an everlasting flow of water, revealing everlasting life. It's clear as crystal because it comes from the throne of God and the Lamb. That means it's unpolluted, and it reflects God's glory. It says in verses 2 and 3, in the middle of the street and either side of the river is the tree of life. So the river flows to the middle of the city. The tree is large enough to span the river. The river is in the midst of the street, and the tree is on both sides of the river. The river is not necessarily wide, but it is narrow, which allows for that arrangement. The tree of life is the counterpart of the tree of life found in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3.22, it's revealed that to eat of it makes physical death impossible. But in New Jerusalem, this tree bears fruit that is edible continually. It's a fruit-bearing tree. Now, a fruit-bearing tree is a concept that is to express the blessings of God. That's because fruit on a tree provides food and therefore is a blessing. Notice in verse 2, it bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The fact that he speaks of 12 trees with 12 kinds of fruit speaks of variety. Since there's no longer any time, it speaks, speaks of a continuous provision. The leaves of the tree, notice in verse 2, are for the healing of the nations. The word healing is the word, where you get the word thera therapeutic from. It speaks of health-giving leaves. They promote the enjoyment of life in New Jerusalem, not for healing sickness, because life in heaven is going to be filled with energy, exciting and it's going to be joyful. Food is going to be eaten, John. It's going to be eaten not to sustain life, but to make it more pleasant. Notice verse 3, there shall be no, no more curse. The curse on earth has been removed. That means there's no sorrow. There's no sickness, pain, or death. In verse 3 again, the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. So serving God and being with him, will be our greatest joy. In 1 Samuel 12, 24, it says, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he's done for you. And finally, in verses 4 and 5, they shall see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. Now, Jesus had said in Matthew 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. In 1 Timothy 6, 16, God dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. But we're going to be able to see him. We will be perfectly holy and righteous. We shall be able to endure the glory of God without being consumed by it. And notice again in verse 4, his name shall be on their foreheads. That's another way of saying that we belong exclusively to him. And finally, in verse 5, there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. The joy will last for eternity as we believers reign forever and ever with him. Second Timothy 2.12 says, if we endure, we will reign with him. We shall see him as he is, and we shall worship him 
And we shall, we shall look upon the face of the one who wept for us in the garden. We shall look upon the lamb, the lamb of God that was slain for us. We'll be able to see him. And eyes will behold him. And, and near us will be those that went before us, those who were believers. I'll see my grandmother who was a believer. I never met her. She died when my mom was nine months old. I'll see my grandfather who my mom said read the Bible every day and I have his Bible in my home. I will see my mom, my dad. I will see those whom I've loved who have gone before me. I'll be able to walk up to my pastor Chuck and give him a hug again. I'll see Steve Mays and some very dear friends who have preceded me. What would be better than, than that? What would be better, guys, than to sing praise and worship God, to be at complete peace with nothing but joy? What would be ble more blessed than that? Nothing. So we prepare our hearts to meet him. We prepare to see him. And I get to be with my Marie forever and ever and ever and ever. And I look forward to enjoying Jesus with mama, with my wife. What is better than that? Nothing. Nothing. Father, we bless you. We bless you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord, I ask that we would keep our eyes on you, especially in these troubled days that we live in. Our hope is in you. I ask that you would awaken the church. I ask that we would stop placing our eyes on what is around us now and start looking to the future that we might be driven by love. For even as Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. So I lift up your church, Lord. It's easy to, to be distracted by what we see going on and things we're concerned with. I ask that we would not be cowardly, that we would open our hearts and share your good news with people. And Father, I ask for this church that you would just do your work in us. And so I lift up every member here, every person, and those who are watching, that we would fall in love even deeper with you today and that we would serve you. For, Lord, that is what will take place. We will serve you for eternity in joy and gratitude for what you've done. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are, are bowed, perhaps there are some we need to get right with the Lord right now. Perhaps you're watching on, online in the overflow or in this room. And you need to get right with the Lord. And if you need prayer, I, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand right now, right where you're at, that I might pray for you. Lord, you see these hands that are going up. I ask in Jesus' name that you would reach down and you would touch each person whose hand is, is raised to you. And Lord, I ask that you would move in such a way as to transform. Awaken us to your forgiveness and your love. And may we live for you from this moment on. And Jesus, I ask that you would have your way in us. And we look forward to seeing you. But until that moment, from this moment, may we serve you faithfully. And we thank you, Lord. And we receive from you right now and bless you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I ask that you continue to move in us. In your name, amen.